So thank you, Dean Lester. Do I call you Dean or do I call you Acting Dean? Okay, just Dean Lester is great. It's wonderful to be here. Um, but I have to confess, I'm a little anxious to be here. I'm anxious because one part of my life, a big chunk of the last 25 years of my life has been as an academic. But the part of my life I want to talk about tonight is life as an activist. I've spent a chunk of my life talking about academic questions, but I want to ask citizen questions tonight. And I was led to this shift by a certain recognition, a recognition that I know many of the people in this audience share, the recognition that something fundamental is not working. I got to this place by thinking about IP, both the IP as in TCP IP and the IP as in copyright as IP. My academic work focused in this area. In this sense, I spent a big chunk of my life in the same place Thomas Jordan spent his life. And in this space, as we talked about these issues for over 15 years, I saw progress everywhere in the recognition and understanding of people, universities, businesses, parents, ordinary Americans about the need for progress and to update the way in which the law thought about both the regulation of technology and the regulation of copyright. We saw progress everywhere except for this place. In this place, members of Congress promulgated ideas like the statute in honor of this great American, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, <laughs> a statute which extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years, an idea which when we challenged in the Supreme Court, we had a brief by a bunch of economists, including this right, le left wing, no, I'm sorry, this is Milton Friedman, right wing <laughs> Nobel Prize winning economist who said he would join the brief attacking the statute only if the word no-brainer was somewhere in the brief. So obvious was it that you couldn't advance the public good by extending the term of existing copyrights, but apparently there were no brains in this place when Congress unanimously extended the term of existing copyrights. An institution that promulgated this statute, the SOPA PIPA statute, which brought Wikipedia to shut down in protest and a year ago then led thousands of people to call their Congress people to get them to withdraw that idea. A regime that leads people like this US attorney, Carmen Ortiz, to say something like, stealing is stealing, whether you use a computer command or a crowbar, showing clearly she understands neither computers nor crowbars. So <laughs> the question is, why is it, I asked about six years ago, our political system is so bad in understanding and updating its recognition of the way the law should work in this particular area. In about 2006, I'm embarrassed to say I had the recognition that, of course, it wasn't just here in the area of IP that this failure to understand and update occurred. It was in a wide range of areas, but the particular focus that I had at that time was around this film, which a friend of mine made for Al Gore, and so I got to see Gore present this talk again and again and again, and it hit me. I thought I was a smart person, but when I realized it took me so long to recognize this, I realized I couldn't be a smart person. It hit me that it wasn't just esoteric questions like IP, where we couldn't get a Congress to respond to the obvious truths that other people got. It was in this fundamental area too, and in many fundamental areas. And when you ask why is it the institution was incapable of focusing here, I was struck by the comment of James Hansen, who of course is one of Al Gore's heroes in the context of this film. But as Hansen accounts for the failure of the system to understand and respond to global warming, he says, I believe the biggest obstacle to solving global warming is the role of money in politics. So between 2006 and 2007, I had the great pleasure of being in Berlin. I was writing the final book that I wrote in this space, Remix, about this issue. And I was visited by an extraordinary young man, uh, Aaron Swartz, 
who came to Berlin to attend a conference called the Chaos Computer Conference, and in January I came to visit me at, at the American Academy. And we had a long conversation that night, the two of us, and he said to me in that conversation, how are you going to ever deal with the issues that you care about without dealing with this corruption first? And I said to him, you know, Aaron, it's not my field. It's not my field. And he said, as an academic? And I said, yes, as an academic, it's not my field. My field is technology and policy, and I've uh, focused my energy there. And he said, well, what about as a citizen? What about as a citizen? And it was that conversation that led me to decide that I was going to throw away all the intellectual capital I had built for the last 10 to 15 years and start a new project, which I announced that summer, a project to focus on this question of the corrupting influence of money and how do we rally or build the recognition necessary to address it. And it's this move between the academic and the citizen that I want us to think about tonight. And in particular, I want to think about the luxuries we can afford as citizens and as academics. Because as academics, we have to recognize, at least in America, it's as great as it has ever been in the history of human culture. It's as great as it's ever been. The resources, the opportunity, the culture encourages us to tinker, to question, to wait, to watch, to quibble. It is what we do as academics. But the question I want to ask tonight is, what do we do as citizens? Can we afford this luxury as citizens? Because when you think back to other moments in our history, when a political system felt it had to confront fundamental issues, it didn't have the luxury that academics have today. Think back to the founding. Framers recognizing the nation was about to fall off the cliff, recognizing they needed to figure out a new structure. All they had was history, a little bit of law. They didn't even understand Adam Smith yet. They had no regressions. They had, didn't even have Windows 3.1. They had none of these things for addressing the most important issues that they had, yet they had to address them. They had to address them with what they knew and architect a constitutional system they thought would make sense with what they knew. And the puzzle is now that we have more than they had, but it feels as if we have less capacity to do anything with what we have. Less capacity to resolve and move forward, to decide, to fix. And I think we can't afford less anymore. We have to think about how do we frame what we do in a way to get us into something more. So here's the argument I want to lay out. I'm going to set it up with a certain framing of the problem. But I want to introduce this problem by telling you a story. And Disney told me that all stories have to begin like this. So once upon a time, the story goes, with all due respect to the dean, there was a place called Lesterland. Lesterland. Now, uh, Jillian didn't mention this because it's a secret. I don't like anybody to know this, so don't tell anybody. But my first name is Lester, so I'm allowed to make fun of Lester's. I'm not making fun of the dean. I'm making fun of, I'm invoking my own name here, Lesterland. So here's Lesterland. Lesterland looks a lot like the United States. Like the United States, it has about 310 million people. And of the 310 million people, it turns out 144,000 of them are named Lester. So that means about 0.05% of Lesterland is named Lester. Now the thing about Lesterland is that Lesters have a certain kind of power in Lesterland. There are two elections, every election cycle in Lesterland. There's a general election, and there is a Lester election. In the Lester election, the Lesters get to vote. In the general election, all citizens over 18, in some states if you have an ID, get to vote. But here's the catch. To be allowed to run in the general election, you must do extremely well in the Leicester election. You don't necessarily have to win, but you must do extremely well. Now, what can we say about this picture of democracy called Leicester Lamb? Well, we can say, number one, as the Supreme Court said in Citizens United, that the people in Leicester Land have the ultimate influence over elected officials. 
because after all, there is a general election. But only after the Lesters had their way with the candidates who wish to run in that general election. And number two, we can say, obviously, this dependence upon the Lesters is going to produce a subtle, understated, maybe camouflaged bending to keep these Lesters happy. And number three, reform that angers the Lesters is likely to be highly unlikely in Lesterland. Okay. Now, once you have this conception of Lesterland, I want you to see three things that follow from this conception. Number one. The United States is Lesterland. The United States is Lesterland. The United States also looks like this, also has two elections. One's called the general election. The other is called the money election. In the general election, all citizens get to vote if you're over 18. In some states, if you have an ID, in the money election, it's the relevant funders who get to vote. And as in Lesterland, to be allowed to run in the general election, you must do extremely well in the money election. You don't necessarily have to win. There are Jerry Browns in this story, but you must do extremely well. But here's the key. There are just as few relevant funders in this democracy as there are Lesters in Lesterland. Now you say, really? 0.05%? We'll hear the numbers from 2012. 2012, 0.4% of America gave more than $200 to any federal candidate. 0.055 gave the maximum amount to any federal candidate. 0.01 gave $10,000 or more to federal candidates. 0.0003% gave $100,000 or more. And my favorite statistic, 0.000042%. And for those of you doing the numbers, you know that's 132 Americans gave 60% of the super PAC money spent in the 2012 election cycle. So I'm just a humble lawyer. I look at 0 0.4, 0 0.055, 0 0.01. I think it's fair for me to say 0.05% is a fair estimate of the relevant funders in our system for funding elections. In this sense, the funders are our Lesters. Now, like we can say about Lester land, this is what we can say about USA land. Number one, Supreme Court is completely right. The people have the ultimate influence, the ultimate influence over the elected officials because there is a general election, but only after the funders have had their way with the candidates who wish to run in that general election. And number two, obviously, this dependence upon the funders produces the subtle, understated, camouflaged, we could say, bending to keep the funders happy. Members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress to get their party back into power. Democratic leadership handed out this PowerPoint slide to all incoming Democratic freshmen. This slide, which gives them their daily schedule, their daily schedule, which includes explicitly four hours devoted to the task of calling to raise money. And this is just during the day. What do they do at night? Go to fundraisers and raise more money. Now, any human that had this life would develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what you do will affect your ability to raise money. In the words of the X-Files, they will become shape shifters <laughs> as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. And to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> And then point three, reform that angers the funders is likely to be highly unlikely in USA as Lesterland. That's the first point to see. Here's the second. The United States is Lesterland. The United States is worse than Lesterland. Worse than Lesterland. Because you can imagine in Lesterland, if we Lesters got a letter from the government that said, you know, you guys get to pick who's going to be the candidates that run in the general election, you can imagine we would develop a kind of aristocratic attitude we would believe, begin to believe we need to act in the interest of the country as a whole. You know, Lesters come from all parts of society. There are rich Lesters, poor Lesters, black Lesters, whites. Not many women Lesters, except the dean, of course, but not many women Lesters. But put that aside for a second. They come from all parts of society. It's at least possible that the Lesters would be inspired to act for the good of Lesterland. But in our land, in this land, in USA land, the Lesters act for the Lesters, because the shifting coalitions that comprise the 0.05% comprise the 0.05% because of the issues they know will be decided in the next congressional term. 
So if it's climate change legislation, it's oil companies and coal companies that comprise a significant portion of the 0.05%. If it's healthcare, it's pharmaceutical companies or doctors or insurance companies that comprise a significant portion of the 0.05%. Whatever the issue is, that what does, that's what determines who the Lesters are, and these Lesters don't gather for the public interest. So in this sense, the United States is worse than Lesterland. And then point number three, whatever one wants to say about Lesterland, against the background of its tradition, whatever explains this interesting little place. In our land, in USA land, we have to recognize that a Lester land-like government is a corruption. A corruption. Now, by corruption, I don't mean cash secreted around in brown paper bags. I don't mean a kind of Rob Lagojevich sense of corruption. <laughs> I'm not talking about the violation of any criminal statute. I'm not asserting that anybody in our system does anything illegal. I'm not talking about breaking the law. Instead, I mean a corruption relative to the framers' baseline for how the republic was to function. So the framers gave us what they explicitly called a republic. But by a republic, they meant a representative democracy. And by a representative democracy, as Madison explains in Federalist 52, they meant a government that would have a branch that would be dependent upon the people alone. So here's the model of government. They have the people, they have the government. I do my own slides. It's cool the way that bounces like that. Okay. The people and the government. And through that exclusive dependency, so would the public good be found. But here's the problem. Congress has evolved a different dependence. Not a dependence upon the people alone, but increasingly a dependence upon the funders. This is a dependence too. But it's different and conflicting from a dependence upon the people alone, so long as the funders are not the people. It is a corruption, and we should understand it precisely as a corruption of the architecture of this republic. Now, I want to claim the right to say this, that it's a corruption. I want to claim the right as an academic to say this, because I have credentials here, right? I'm a constitutional law professor. Indeed, I'm an adult constitutional law professor because I've been teaching for 21 years constitutional law, okay? And in the gestation period, this is getting really weird, this was my teacher too, okay? So I have a sense of the Constitution tradition, I think it allows me to assert that this is a kind of corruption. I believe that if I could bring a string of framers back, I could convince them that this is a corruption of the system they described. But the difficulty for me as an academic is that I want to say more than just that. I want to say that this corruption has an effect. I want to say it has an effect on us citizens and it has an effect on our government. So it has an effect on our us citizens in the way it drives us to regard our government. So first effect is this. Americans believe. It's a separate question. I think Americans are right to believe, but let's focus on their belief. Americans believe, quote, money buys results in Congress. 75% of Americans, according to a poll I conducted for the book that I published last fall, a little bit higher Democrats than Republicans, but I guarantee you before the Republicans took control of the House, it was just as many Republicans as Democrats. So whether it's two-thirds or three-fourths, here's the one thing we Americans all believe. Money buys results in Congress. Leading to point number two, that belief undermines trust in the institution of Congress. Uh, ABC and New York Times published a poll last year saying that 9% of Americans had confidence in our Congress. 9%? Put that in some context, it's certainly the case at the time of the American Revolution. Higher percentage of Americans had confidence in the British crown than have confidence in our Congress today. And that leads to point number three. This weakened trust weakens the reasons one has to participate. So this is the point that David Souter made in Nixon versus Shrink, Missouri. He said, leave the perception of impropriety unanswered and the cynical assumption that large donors call the tune could jeopardize the willingness of voters to take part in democratic governance. It's what Rock the Vote discovered in 2010. In 2008, they turned out the largest number of young voters in the history of voting to that uh, point. 2010, they found that a significant number of their voters were just not going to turn out, so they polled them to ask them why. The number one reason by far, two to one of the second highest reason was, no matter who wins, corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change. And it's not just kids. 
vast majority of people in 2010 who could have voted did not vote. I submit in part at least because of this belief. And even in this election, 40% of the people who could have voted did not vote in part at least because of this belief. That is its effect on us. But maybe more significant is its effect on our government. Because I believe this economy, has, this corruption has a certain economy. An economy that has actors, the lobbyists, the members, the lesters working together in an economy. And this economy has an effect. Two in particular I want to identify here. Number one, we can think of the economy of no that gets produced by this economy of these three actors. And number two, the economy of extortion. So let's think first about the economy of no. In any system where this tiny fraction of the 1% are the relevant funders, any system like this means that a tiny number of that tiny fraction of the 1% is sufficient to block any mo mo motion for change. Always, or at least almost always. And this points to the instability that I think we have allowed to evolve inside of this government. This is the economy of no. And this economy depends upon polarization to make it function better. It depends upon dysfunction to make it function better because dysfunction makes it easier to sell the good that is being sold, the good of saying no, of stopping the system from functioning. Dysfunction is the business model. Uh, Lee Fang at The Nation wrote this piece about lobbyists who were trying to stop the reform of the Senate filibuster process. And he quoted from a website one of the lobbyists describing the service that lobbyists could provide to any business that was so interested in securing it. It's a service called Managing Holds and Filibusters. Your organization has an interest in a bill that has, been, has proven controversial, and you require advocacy before those legislature, legislators, often back the bench Senate Republicans, who may exercise their prerogatives to delay or obstruct. Endgame strategies will give you a new way to manage your interests in a legislative environment that gives great power to individual senators. We are auctioning the ability to block. And it's because of this tiny number of les lesters that are needed to exercise the leverage to get them to block, to get them to say no, that we have this economy of no at the center of the way this government now functions. Now, there are exceptions. We can now dream of immigration, uh, immigration reform because this party is fearing its own extinction. There are exceptions. The tragedy in Sandy Hook may bring us to a place that the government can finally address the problem of guns in a comprehensive way. These are exceptions. But they are exceptions against the background of a clear rule. And it's that rule, I suggest, that is the core of the instability in the way this government doesn't function. So that's the economy of no. And then there's the economy of extortion. So I've pointed to the 0.05%, the Lesters. Think now about the 0.00014% members of Congress. Because the dynamic that we should recognize is obvious once you think about it. The dependents, members of Congress, create their own dependencies to help them feed their dependency. So think, for example, about this. The Wall Street Journal two years ago was puzzled by the rise of what they called these temporary tax code provisions. Tax code is riddled with these short-term provisions that expire at a certain point, and if you want them extended, you've got to go to Congress to get them extended once again. And the number of these extensions was growing, and the journal didn't quite understand why they would be growing like this. But from the perspective I'm offering, it should be obvious why they're growing like this. Reagan gave us the first of these temporary provisions, the 1981 Research and uh, Development Tax Credit. It was made temporary because there was an argument about whether it would work. Democrats said it wouldn't work. Republicans said it would work. So they said, OK, let's make it temporary. And then we'll ask economists after a period of time whether it worked. After a period of time, they asked, did it work? And the answer from both sides was, yes, it did work. It made sense absolutely to be part of the tax code because it induced a kind of investment that otherwise would not be there. But here's the puzzle. It is still temporary. To this day, it is temporary. So why is it temporary? Rebecca Kaisar in the Georgia Law Review describes the principal recipients of the research credit are large US manufacturing corporations. These business entities are more than willing to invest in lobbying activities and campaign donations to ensure the continuance of this large tax savings. The Institute for, uh, for um, Policy Innovation puts a little bit more sharply, 
The cycle has repeated itself for years. Congress allows the credit to lapse until another short extension is given, preceded, of course, by a series of fundraisers and speeches about the importance of nurturing innovation. Congress essentially uses this cycle to raise money for re-election, promising industry more predictability the next time around. Or think about this other example, Medicare. I just found this uh, on the web. It's so exciting to me. This is the only large organization in the world that doesn't have a high quality logo on the web. It's kind of, you know, you should be proud of this. The government just doesn't invest in this way, more efficient maybe, but here's their low quality logo, Medicare. Medicare has built within it since the 1990s a provision called the sustainable growth rate provision that's meant to lower the amount that Medicare pays doctors on an annual basis due to his, in, so as to induce more efficiency, the thought was inside of doctors. But of course, every single year this issue comes up, the question is whether Congress is going to delay the reduction in the doctor's pay, and the doc fix, of course, becomes a regular feature of end of year cycle, and it becomes a regular feature because this becomes another moment to induce a lot of money into the campaign process by telling the doctors you need to line up the support you need to continue to pay as it was before. Or think about the fiscal cliff that we've just gone through right now. There are, of course, lots of these things people are discovering in the final settlement of this fiscal cliff. There are plenty of tax extenders in it. There was a doc fix extender in it. But the most interesting was this bit that was uh, revealed in the New York Times last week Outraged Senate staffers secretly revealed this because they couldn't believe that they'd actually gotten this in. There's this provision that indirectly allows the maker of uh, Amgen, uh, which is a drug used for dialysis, not to be subject to a pricing reduction that was otherwise going to kick in after a two-year delay had been already passed two years ago. And that reduction would have saved taxpayers one half of one billion dollars. But they succeeded in getting the delay put in, leading uh, Richard Painter, who was the ethics czar in the Bush administration, to calculate the 9,900% return on investment they earned between the lobbying dollars they spent and the amount of money they will now get because they didn't find themselves subject to this pricing reduction. And it's not just in the context of taxes. Uh, everyone will recognize this, of course, is the Communications Act of 1934 which has seven different six different titles. Title II governs telecom, Title VI governs cable. Al Gore, shortly after inventing the internet, okay, that's cheap, I'm sorry, I mean that, okay. <laughs> after inventing the internet, so Al Gore had the idea as vice president to create a new Title VII that would take the internet-related components of Title II and Title VI and put them under a new provision and fundamentally deregulate the infrastructure provision of broadband uh, internet service. But when he took this idea to Capitol Hill, his chief policy uh, advisor who described this story to me said that the response they got from Capitol Hill was, quote, hell no, if we deregulate these guys, how are we going to raise money from them? Extortion. This is the extortion that enables the fundraising, enables the funding, and that's my point here. We should see this funding as key to the story of how the system functions, or to invoke the metaphor which has motivated many people to be here tonight, the root, Henry David Thoreau, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. The root here is the structure of incentives that leads to the Congress to be able to facilitate this funding, both the incentives to stop through no and through extortion, and the root striker is one who sees but because of the two ways this economy functions, this corruption turns out not to be partisan. It's nonpartisan corruption. The economy of extortion, together with the economy of no, blocks the reforms of both the left and the right. Because whether it's the economy of no or the economy of extortion, if you're on the left and you care about health care reform, the right you care about government bailouts, or the left you care about global warming, or the right you care about a complex tax system, or the left you care about financial reform, or the right you care about financial reform, the point is both sides get blocked by this economy induced by the structure of funding. And as nonpartisans then, or as citizens, it's my view we need to find a way to fix it. Okay, now, if the problem is this dependency, 
or a certain disciplining practice that the dependency produces, the practice of, one, spending tons of time fundraising from a tiny slice of America, those two components together describe the problem, then the problem is not money in the abstract. The problem is not the amount of money that's in the political system. The problem is not to misuse this poster a little bit, that corporations are persons or money is speech. Those are not the problems. The problem is this, that the time spent to raise money from a tiny slice of American people. And if that's the problem, then the solution to that problem is to find a way to address this nature of the problem by changing the time raised spent fundraising and by changing the slice from, of America from which these funds are raised. So to make them, the elections, citizen-funded elections, not Lester-funded elections. That's the solution to the problem if the problem is as I've described it. And the good news is, is that there are plenty of proposals now out there by people who've recognized this as the problem that would push us to a place where elections would be citizen-funded and not Lester-funded. The idea of Bruce Ackerman and Ian Ayers in, in their Voting with Dollars book of vouchers that every citizen would have that they would give to candidates running for Congress to fund their campaigns, an idea which in my book I modified a bit to basically make it conditional upon being able to receive those vouchers that you agree to fund your campaign with vouchers and contributions limited to just $100 per citizen. The Fair Elections Now Act, which would match small dollar contributions and give a pretty large stipend to an initial candidacy to make sure it could run a successful campaign. John Sarbanes' Grassroots Democracy Act, which has matching fund proposal, a tax credit proposal, and a pilot program for the vouchers proposal, or the most ambitious anti-corruption proposal that we've seen, I think, in 100 years, United Republic's American Anti-Corruption Act, which I see they've paper the room right here so you can read all about it, which would create essentially a very large voucher program tied to a whole string of changes that would change the economy of influence inside of Washington. All of these would be solutions to the problem I've described because all of them would bring more citizens, maybe aspiring to all citizens, serving the role as the funders and not just the Lesters. Now, it might also be a solution to something else. If we think about elections and the way I've set them up here, elections can be either discrete or continuous. Discrete in the way that voting elections are discrete. They happen on two days in the course of a two-year cycle. Or continuous in the way that the money election is continuous. Every single day the candidate is trying to raise money, so every single day you have a chance to vote over the whole period of the election cycle. Today with both of these elections, we see candidates appealing to the extremes trying to get the politically motivated class to turn out, and they turn out to be people at the extremes, trying to raise money from those who get motivated the most, they turn out to be people at the extremes. But if we had a voucher system for funding elections, that may be a different set of incentives it would produce. Indeed, it may create the incentives like the incentives that exist in Australia where every single citizen has to show up to the voting booth because they all have to show up to the voting booth, campaigns need to appeal to all citizens because they're very likely to vote if they've showed up at the voting booth. And the vouchers would enfranchise all in a similar way, giving candidates an incentives then to speak to all of these people because all of these people would be necessary to fund the kind of campaigns that needed to be funded if you needed to raise money from the vouchers. Okay, now, that's the solution. There's a problem with that solution though. Or let's say another problem, or maybe most accurately, the real problem here. The real problem, as characterized most forcefully to me by this man, Jim Cooper, who's a Democrat from Tennessee, has been in Congress for as long as all but about 20 other members of Congress. Cooper said, you know, the thing you've got to understand is that Congress has become a kind of farm league for K Street. K Street, where the lobbyists work. And his point is that members and staffers and bureaucrats have an increasingly common business model in their head when they go to Washington, a business model focused on their life after government, their life as lobbyists. 
public citizen calculated between 1998 and 2004, 50% of the Senate left to become lobbyists, 42% of the House. Those numbers have only gone up. United Republic calculated the average salary increase for those they tracked, 1,452% for the members that moved to the lobbying place. So in a world where everyone depends upon the system surviving, this is their future, it's a fair question, how is it possible that they would ever initiate the move to change that system. And I think we have to admit, maybe in our academic mode, it might not be possible. It might not be possible. It might be the system is so entrenched. The incentives are so strong. There isn't the motive. There isn't the lever to get them to change it. But as the citizen, I want to say, if it's possible, it starts in the recognition that happens in places like here. Not necessarily among academics, but among citizens. Citizens who say, we believe this is a corruption. We can see how it contributes to every pathology we see within our government. We can see how it disables and enables government. We can see how it disables reform and enables extortion. Citizens who see this and then think, how can we respond to this problem? And the response, I think, begins with a certain recognition. The Chattarati believe that the interesting distinction in American politics is between the left side and the right side. But I think the interesting division in American politics today is between the inside and the outside. The inside, the world inside of the Beltway, and the outside, the rest of the United States. And to remix the title of this book just a bit, if you think about what they think about and what we think about, we can say DC is from Mars and we are from Earth. <laughs> so this inside and outside each has its own politics. And using the frame Nigel Cameron has given, I want to describe the outsider's politics as a kind of exo-politics. And so exopolitics is not a politics of politicians. These are not wannabe congressmen that I'm talking about. It's citizen politics. It's citizens demanding that their politics change. And what we've seen is repeated waves of self-described open source energy driving to this change in many different contexts, many different places, and increasingly frequently. I think the first of these is 1998 Move On, where a couple of programmers here in Berkeley look up from their computer and say, wait a minute, the United States Congress is going to impeach a man for lying about sex? What's going on here? There are a million problems more important than this problem. Why is the whole United States Congress stopped and focused on this? So they started a movement, Move On, which had a technique for building a list and a petition and very quickly had millions of people, Republicans and Democrats alike, saying, move on from this problem, censure the man and get back to the business you're supposed to be engaged in. And it had a significant effect in pushing Congress away from that strategy of impeachment. 2009, I believe the Tea Party Patriots, the grassroots component of the Tea Party movement, was another exo-political movement, using the infrastructure of the network and what they describe as open source energy to rally an incredible number of people to the cause that they believed in, even if it's not a cause that I would affirm. I think the Occupy movement in 2009 was an exo-political movement. I think the movement that stopped SOPA in 2012, a movement that Aaron Swartz helped engineer, was another exo-political movement. These are all cases of power welling up from the ground. It's something new, could be something new, but in my view is if there is hope, it's going to be from this exo-political power. But this exo-politics needs a way to speak speak so it sounds like it's citizens speaking, not so it sounds like it's polarized parts of America speaking. So not these different groups that stand and represent small segments of our public, not as partisans, but as citizens. And the challenge is to think, what could we do to build that? But I actually think California has begun to do that. I think the experiments that were started with the California Forward Movement using deliberative democracy from Stanford, from Jim Fishkin at, uh, at Stanford, to bring together citizens in a context where they can make reasonable and sensible judgments 
about how to address the problems that they all acknowledge gives us an alternative to the kind of clown-like, I'm sorry, that's really unfair, but I'm just kind of, clown-like way in which Congress now functions. And my view is we need something like this. We need to use something like this if we're going to build the alternative that this exopolitical movement must eventually be. Okay, let me just say one more point before I stop here. So some of us will remember these images, March of 1989, when a ship under the command of Captain Joseph Hazelwood ran aground in uh, Prince William Sound and spilled about 11 million gallons of oil into the ocean. This is the radio broadcast from Mr. Hazelwood reporting the accident to the, to the command. Yeah, uh, tell me that uh, we uh, should be on the radar that we fetched up uh, So I'm sure many of you had the same thought that many people had after this accident, especially after hearing a transmission like that. The thought being, uh, was Captain Hazelwood drunk at the time he was captaining a super tanker? He denied it. He said he'd only had four vodkas before he got on board that night to captain the ship, but his blood alcohol level said he must have been at least six times the legal limit when he got on board, but his lawyers fought it. He was adjudicated, he was never convicted, so let's say there's some doubt about whether Hazelwood was drunk. What there was no doubt about was that he had a problem with alcohol. Mother testified he had a problem with alcohol, and Exxon knew about it in 1985. Exxon treated him for his problem with alcohol. After the accident, Exxon's president said he thought he had mastered the problem. But in 1986, three years before the accident, he'd been arrested and convicted of a DUI, and in 1988, one year before the accident, he'd been arrested again and convicted of a driving under the influence. At the time he was captaining a super tanker, he was not allowed to drive a VW Beetle. <laughs> okay, but forget Hazelwood. What I want you to think about is those around Hazelwood, the other officers, people who could have picked up a phone. While a drunk was driving a super tanker, I want you to think about the people who did nothing. What do we think about them? You know, they had their jobs. Realism told them nothing would be done regardless of what I said. They kept their heads down. They focused on their work. They ignored this problem. What do we think about them? And I ask that question in this way because as I think about the problem I've described tonight, I increasingly believe we are they. We are they. The nation faces critical problems requiring serious attention, but we have these institutions incapable of this attention, distracted, unable to focus, aloof. And who is to blame for that? Who is responsible for that? It's too easy to blame the Blagojeviches. It's too easy to blame the evil people. There are evil people in these stories, but there are good people too decent people, the people who could have picked up a phone, us. We, the most privileged, the most capable, have the obligation to fix this. As academics, maybe not, because we can't perhaps say clearly enough what the source of these problems is and what the remedy for them is. Maybe not as academics, but as citizens. Because the most outrageous part is that the corruptions I've been describing have been primed by the most privileged, but permitted by the passivity of the most privileged too, us. Thank you very much. <laughs>